So I shall get started and uh, please do keep introducing yourselves as you go. So welcome to this special event this morning. It's a bit of a joint event really between the Knowledge Equity Network, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment, and um, our library series, the Open um, the Open Lunch series that we tend to run. So uh, I'm Nick Shepherd. I'm Open Research Advisor based here in the library at the University of Leeds uh, and also one of the senior leads for the Knowledge Equity Network. I'm very pleased today to welcome um, a couple of speakers. We've got Anne Campbell from Digital Science and so kind of from the University of Amsterdam, uh, who I'll introduce in a bit more detail in a moment. Also, just to acknowledge my colleague Tom Freeth, who's helped me organise this event from the Knowledge Equity side. Um, so on the right hand side there, I've got our logos for the respective um, Knowledge Equity Network and the Open Lunch. So other, unlike Tom and I, um, we decided our um, colour schemes don't work together terribly well. So the orange and the blue don't really go together, I'm afraid, but uh, that's no indication for how Tom and I work together. But this is a joint event between the two of us. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the um, the, the Open Lunch the, and the, the Knowledge Equity Network. That's the plan for this morning. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction um, to uh, the network and some of the work that we do in it leads and across the sector in terms of um, open research and knowledge equity before handing over to Anne and Saab. So Anne Campbell is Technical Solutions Manager at Digital Science. So I met Anne quite recently through the UKRN pilot projects that some colleagues may be aware of. So that's uh, uh, project looking at open research indicators um, with several uh, universities and um, providers across the UK. So Digital Science is one of those um, providers, along with Open Air is another one, and we're working with Elsevier as well, and um, who else? Uh, but there's several providers, you can find more information on that online. So that's how I met Anne recently and got talking to her a bit about some of the work that Digital Science and Dimensions Database uh, are doing around inclusive metrics. So we'll hear from Anne, and then um, we'll hear from Sarah Kana, who is Assistant Professor of Communication Science at the University of Amsterdam, and also works with PKP, the Public Knowledge Project. Um, so he'll be talking about their work. So I heard um, Saab speak um, at an event for the Forum for Open Research in MENA, that's the Middle East and Northern Africa, and it was a fascinating talk. So I reached out to him, very pleased he's agreed to come and talk to us today around some of those issues in terms of um, diversity of scholarly outputs in uh, the, the Global South in particular and some of the um, initiatives that the Public Knowledge Project in particular is doing there. Um, so before I do hand over to them, I'll just introduce quickly the Knowledge Equity Network for those that aren't familiar with it. So uh, Knowledge Equity Network, or KEN for short, is a collaborative network of higher education institutions, organisations and individuals working towards the principles outlined in the Declaration on Knowledge Equity that you can find on the Knowledge um, Equity Network website. Um, I'll post a chat link to that in a moment, or perhaps Tom can, can dig it out as well. So please do take a moment to sign the declaration on the website if you haven't done so already, um, if of course you agree with the principles. So that's there to have a look at. Uh, and through the webinars that we've hosted through Ken, um, we're working to promote open education, open research, equity, diversity, inclusion, technology for all, which is a big theme of today's talk and to look at alternative models of reward and recognition, which embody a collaborative focus. Um, so if you are interested in joining the network or learning more, please do reach out to our team, whether myself or Tom, um, and discuss how we can collaborate across these areas and you know, bring real change across the sector. Just to emphasize the library uh, statements so of the University of Leeds Library's vision for 2030, Knowledge for All, um, has very similar emphasis to uh, the Knowledge Equity Network, and we work um, very closely with uh, Tom and colleagues and uh, with the whole open research agenda at Leeds and across the sector, as I already mentioned, the Open Research uh, Indicators Project with the UKRN. Um, and the broader issues of open research, open education, open knowledge, and of course, open infrastructure. And I've just acknowledged there on the right hand side, perhaps some of the more fundamental issues that perhaps need to um, be aware of, uh, such as internet access, language bias is a really interesting one that I think Sarah will touch on today, and information and digital literacy. Um, but really just trying to emphasize, you know, real collaboration, moving away from competition and acknowledging the fact that, you know, we're all aware of the many challenges facing the world today and that we really need to collaborate across um, the globe um, to make meaningful change in all sorts of different areas. So um, one of the 
a couple of talks we've had recently around the World University Rankings. So if you didn't catch those, they are recorded online. So I'm sure many colleagues will be familiar with the work of Dr. Lizzie Gadd. Um, so she did a talk for us on rankings and looking at the impact on knowledge, equity and openness. So um, as I say, I'm sure many colleagues will be aware of her as a powerful voice uh, uh, in terms of some of the problems and some of the issues around World University Rankings. Um, we also had a talk um, from Dr. Michalisi Masango, Masango and Dr. Hussain Masumi Karakani from the University of Pretoria, which was one of the founding universities of the Knowledge Equity Network, actually partners with the University of Leeds. And they were talking about uh, the rankings in the context of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, again, colleagues may be aware that uh, THE have recently uh, inaugurated a sub-Saharan university rankings um, which uses Scopus data. Now, again, there's issues with the inclusivity in terms of uh, Scopus and Web of Science um, that we'll talk about today in terms of how that, you know, skews the data towards the global north, which is thrown into relief when you're actually using that very same data to rank the universities potentially or aspects of their ranking in the global south and in sub-Saharan Africa. So that was a really interesting talk that you can catch online as well. Um, and really, I just wanted to uh, highlight before I do hand over some of the high profile stories that, again, I'm sure many will be familiar with, that perhaps suggest that university, European universities are beginning to take these issues seriously. Um, but I think there's, you know, certainly a lot more to be done. Um, and perhaps we could sort of suggest that Russell Group Universities, which are the big research intensive universities in the UK, but perhaps paying lip service rather than fully engaging with things like DORA, so the Declaration on Research Assessment, you know, um, the, there is a lot of work going on, but I think it, it, it could go further, um, has, as evidenced by COARA, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, which is similar to DORA, but much more emphasis on, you know, taking real action in terms of addressing some of these challenges. There have been some uh, small movements, well, not small, I suppose, quite significant in terms of Utrecht withdrawing from the rankings. So that's uh, probably one of the most high profile things that's happened recently. And they really stressed that um, the rankings put too much stress on scoring and competition, while they as a university really want to focus on collaboration and open science. Um, and really just emphasised as well that it's almost impossible to capture the quality of an entire university with all the different courses and disciplines in one number. Um, and that was something that came through quite strongly in the talk that uh, Hussein and Michalisi did for the Knowledge Equity Network as well, talking about, you know, what the actual role of a university is in the context of South Africa, in their case, and um, how the rankings are a sort of double-edged sword at the very best, perhaps, in terms of actually um, changing how a, a university is, is, uh, is marketed, etc. Then, of course, there's the um, Barcelona Declaration on Open Research, which, again, I'm sure many are familiar with. Again, quite a recent initiative um, that talks about uh, the openness of information and the conduct of communication research must be the new norm in terms of openness and focuses on four particular areas. So making sure that the openness is the default for the research information we use and produce and work with services and systems that support and enable open research information. Um, and support sustainability of infrastructures for open research information. So I think that infrastructural question is a really interesting one that's uh, gaining traction at the moment. Um, and supporting collective action, again, that collective action and collaboration to accelerate the transition to openness of research information. Uh, information. Um, and then the other story, just to highlight quickly, again, I'm sure quite high profile that people will be aware of, is that the Sorbonne University um, recently unsubscribed from Web of Science. And again, they were citing their deep commitment to the promotion and development of open science for many years. Um, and according to that commitment, they decided to discontinue its subscription to Web of Science um, and the Clarivate bibliometric tools. And that by resolutely abandoning the use of proprietary bibliometric tools, it's opened the way for open, free and participatory um, tools. So um, as I say, there's certainly some movement in this area, but undoubtedly something more that we could do as a sector and as uh, individual universities to to develop this further. Before I do hand over now to Anne, I just wanted to highlight a couple of um, upcoming events, knowledge equity related events. So there's another event for, the, for Ken on the 19th of June, on Wednesday, 19th of June. So the QR codes there on the right hand side will take you through to that, the top one to register for that one. 
The bottom one is uh, Knowledge Equity Symposium with Ken at Vidge University Amsterdam. I can't say that very well. Um, my Dutch is limited, to say the least. Uh, and again, there's a QR code on the right-hand side there. I don't believe that will actually allow you to register at the moment for a, a, a virtual event. I think it's an in-person event, but if I understand correctly, there will be, if you do register, there will be a, a link to a, um, a, a remote attendance for that as well. We've also got another open lunch coming up uh, later in this month on Wednesday, the June the 26th. So that's looking at open access in the humanities. Uh, again, everybody's very welcome to come along to that, exploring alternative models with, uh, we've got a colleague from Bloomsbury Open Collections and also a speaker from the British Society for the Philosophy of Science. Um, and they're talking about um, developing diamond models for open access in the humanities. So do please come along to those. So I will now hand over to Anne, if that's all right, Anne. Uh, I think you've got some slides to share. And just to encourage colleagues to ask any questions as we go, do post them either in the chat or in the Q&A feature as we go. So I'll hand over to you, Anne, if that's all right. Um, thanks so much, Nick. I'm just going to... Thanks for your patience, <laughs> everyone. Um, and thank you, Nick, um, for the lovely introduction. So my name is Anne Campbell, and as Nick had um, explained, uh, Nick and I met as part of the Open Research Indicators Pilot Program with University of Leeds. So um, I work with uh, Dimensions, a company called Dimensions. But previous to that, just move this as well. Um, I worked uh, in Ulster University, for, well, since a long time, 2006, I think I started there and previously as a, as a researcher up to MPhil. So um, as part of that, I spent um, over 10 years working as a research systems and data manager with Ulster University. And after that, moved on to um, Queen's University, where I worked with EDI data, just evidencing success of different initiatives for Athena Swan and the racial equality initiatives um, or the charter. And then... Um, I've moved over as we, we laugh and joke about the dark side. So I've moved over to a company now called Digital Science. So we have a whole load of portfolios. Uh, we have big share um, elements, dimensions, altmetric, read cube, overlay. You've probably heard of, of some of those, but I'm primarily working with dimensions and altmetric. Um, I'm very big into the data. My background is really a data analyst um, and a bit of a programmer, although I wouldn't profess to be anyway good at it. Um, I'm not really annoying person, just that when people say, talk about things anecdotally, I always want to see the data to prove and evidence um, what everyone's talking about. And I think it's very important um, when we, especially when we're talking about issues such as these. Um, so a brief introduction to Dimensions itself, um, if, and just in case um, you don't know what it is, um, I'll not spend too long on this because it's not about the, the product at all. But um, so we are, when we say we, it's a huge database um, that covers the entire research landscape, basically. Um, what Dimensions does is it picks up over 143 million publications at this point, um, over 7 million grants. Uh, dimensions have um, an agreement with over 700 funders, so we get the funding and grant information directly from them. And we've got agreements with publishers as well. And we collect policy documents, citations, clinical trial data, and there's over 160 million patents um, on the database as well, and over 30 million data sets. Um, but the real um, cool thing about Dimensions is that it's all linked so it's and it's all in one platform so you can look at that whole story between um the grant award right through to the publication and the impact of that publication as well now we're one of the biggest publications uh, databases and you can see that because um at dimensions we believe that it, it's not our data it's open data for starters and so we facilitate by bringing that all together and the second thing is we don't and just concentrate on like index journals because there is a lot of research that may be overlooked that isn't in these index journals. So we capture absolutely everything. Now there's probably good sides to that and there's maybe bad sides. For example, there could be predatory journals um, about, but I think it's a good thing because then when you look at this data, that's what the, the outside world can see. So it's good to look and see what's out there but um, if we look at the research life cycle, um, going back to on a linear scale, so traditionally 
um, when you look at measuring and research metrics, um, traditionally people would look at the publications and the citations. But then again, when you look at all of the other parts of the research life cycle that is cap captured within the Dimensions database, you can see um, you can see grants, research conferences, and preprints collect that data sets hugely important when it comes to open research and um, tweets, blogs. We also measure the um, altmetric data. So the altmetric would be alternative kind of metrics as well. So for instance, policy citations, social media attention as well. Um, citations, obviously, clinical trials, patents, and the policy documents themselves. And this means that um, you don't have to wait maybe two, three, four years after a grant or award has been received before you see the research output of that, you can almost see it immediately. And you can see the grants that are being awarded, who they're being awarded to, um, the early research that people are talking about through the social um, media or social attention. And then you can obviously track and trace the, the data sets should they be um, uploaded as well or logged in any repositories. I'm a huge aspect of my um, role is looking at things like um, impact. And one of my big, it's my personal kind of um, project that I've going on is, is tracking maybe around the sustainable development goals. And again, digital science are hugely um, invested in helping and, and doing that in terms of classifying research in different ways. Um, but I do think that the sustainable development goals are key drivers um, for interdisciplinarity, for collaboration and open research and for breaking down these silos. But when we think about the sustainable development goals, we're talking about global issues, not just the global north. These are global issues and the, it's the less developed regions are mainly bearing the brunt of these global issues as well. Um, before I go on to the next slide, uh, just to talk about a little bit about what Dimensions actually does in, in terms of addressing some of these things. So I said previously that we do pick up um, journals and research from everywhere and we allow the end user to decide what research they want to include. Um, we work very closely with stakeholders in the African region. Um, one of our close stakeholders would be Joe or Joy Oango from the training TCC, which is the Training and Communications Centre. Um, and there's there's plenty that uh, we're working. So over the past three years, digital science have been really working hard to promote social justice and to work with government and to make sure that the research in these areas are becoming more and more visible. So um, an example of that would be just indexing the research organisations because if they're not indexed, they're not visible and they're not being picked up. And one of the things Joy has said to me in the past that's really um, stuck with me is that a lot of um, maybe researchers or, or people in the in the research ecosystem just don't see that um, research and it's not there, so then it mustn't be there. But um, Joy and the team that we work with with Digital Science recognise that there is uh, good research going on in these areas and it's just not visible and they're actively working with stakeholders to address the problem and to provide some solutions but we can't do that you know you can't do that on your own it takes a lot of people from that region to, to help and there will be an announcement made next week about some of the partnerships that we have um, not only with the NRF or with the African funders, but other funders as well. So we're going to really index them and pick up so much more. So you'll actually see more and more data coming into the Dimensions database to really champion the, the research that's going on there as well. But they would openly admit that there are um, siloed systems and challenging infrastructures there. So there's things like um, identifiers that need to be assigned and a lot of um, strengthening just the ecosystem um, over there. So we work a lot with Figshare. There's a team from Figshare that would work with the libraries as well and African Journals Online. So um, again, all of those initiatives, um, partnering with um, institutions in these areas to make that research more visible. Um, one of the things that uh, I work on just I'm probably jumping a little bit is and, and I've worked on this area with Nick is um open research. So we think that um which we call it maybe like research integrity and culture and believe that this could be a metric that can be used 
um, across the board. It's a diverse metric that you know anyone can use, any researcher can do. One of these things might be data availability. Um, so what dimensions can do within is they can facilitate open research by tracking publications to see, say, for example, if there's a data availability statement. And what that would do is, you know, that's obviously benefits to the research community in terms of aiding um, and replicating studies as well. And also in increasing that trust by validating the findings and reducing duplications of effort, which is hugely important to um, the, the less lesser developed regions. I'm not going to call them lesser developed regions. I'm going to call them emerging research nations because the, the, the research is there um, and, and it is emerging. And, and so... Uh, it's, I'll just refer to it as that from now on. And then um, obviously there's a benefit to universities and assessment bodies as well. So by measuring that extent uh, to which the practices are implemented, um, it does show a university's commitment to transparency and the research integrity. So, and I put here improving its standing in university rankings. And I know university rankings are something quite a controversial area. Um, but one thing that I would say on that is when you look at the, say, the Times Higher Impact Rankings that um, they've an event uh, this week. Um, when they started in 2019, I think there was maybe 400 universities had participated in that. That's jumped to over 2,000 now. That's all to do with sustainable development goals. One thing you can say is there's obviously an influence there. And that influence can be utilised, you know, for the better. Um, and so maybe perhaps it should be looking at, at things like this, look, looking at open research, rewarding, recognizing open research and collaborations um, across globally. Um, and hugely, the other main um, issue with, or not issue, but um, point to data availability and open data is the benefits it has to research trust. So it directly influences the credibility and impact of that research. Not that it's just in a specific journal, but that it's trustful there, the data, the company and data and research is there and available and transparent for people to see. Um, so we looked at uh, capturing data availability and as part of a, a blog that I did um, last year with um, a not a colleague, but a, a partner request in um, Hong Kong Baptist, we looked at the dividing this into different income groups. So we looked at the um, publications and where what universities they were affiliated to. And we found quite quickly that uh, low income countries seem to excel in capturing a data availability and other kind of trust markers that we would measure within dimensions. So author contributions, ethical approval statements, funder acknowledgements and things like that. Um, and then we dove a little bit deeper into this um, and, and looked at the collaboration because people would say, oh, is that just because that country has collaborated with a higher income country? But we found specifically in the case of Ethiopia, and it was Leslie McIntosh, who is our VP of Research Integrity, had actually pointed me in this direction to say, if you're looking for some good practice, look at Ethiopia. And we really found that, do you know, that they excel in these practices. And we think if this data is here and if they're doing this great research and they're excelling in good research practices and open research practices, surely that should be acknowledged, recognized and rewarded as well and championed. So um, I can certainly send you some details of the blog that breaks down the, the growth of research, the growth of collaboration and the growth of um, these practices in Ethiopia. Also looked at um, looking at citation trends specifically in sustainable development goal research. So um, this is again using the dimensions data and how they've classified um, the research by sustainable development goal. And you can see that this, uh, that this particular area of research has almost tripled since 2013. And we can see the notable rise there between um, 19 and uh, 22, which you could probably um, you could put that to COVID and all of the, the the research that went on there, but then you can see it's kind of tapering off now and, and coming back to normal. But there's increases as well in things like affordable and clean energy, climate change and all of the other SDG goals. 
Um, so I, I started breaking down this data, looking at uh, the priorities in different regions. So we can see this is split again into high income, low income, lower middle income and upper middle income. But if we concentrate just on the high income and low income, you can see that there are obvious differences in the priorities there. So zero hunger and clean water and sanitation would be two um, that are higher priority um, in the emerging research nations or regions. So if we start looking at these and if we did a little bit more in-depth analysis on the citation trends, so we could say, sorry, it hasn't really come over too well this slide, but there's um, 99,000 or 90, nearly 96,000 publications on zero hunger that I picked up over the past 10 years. Um, and I'm not even going to say that amount of references there, but on average, there's 41 references per publication. 74% of those references were from high income only authors and only 0.2 references were from low income only authors or references. So, you know, only 1.41% had at least one author from a low income country and then 10.66 had at least one income or one author from a low to medium income country as well. I just thought that those were very, very low. And then similar story for clean water and sanitation. So 71% of references were just high income only authors and then 0.2 were low income only authors. And then you can see those um, figures as well um, down below. So it does jump up a little bit um, to 11.86 when you're looking at low or low to medium income countries, but it's still quite low for that considering that clean water and sanitation and zero poverty are key priorities um, in, these, in these regions. And you know what does that tell us really is that although zero hunger it's a crit it's critical area where low income countries are concerned and where they have the practical expertise and the, the research knowledge, just the inclusion of those references from those researchers is relatively low. And this to me suggests like a complete missed opportunity to leverage that local knowledge. We talk about the indigenous knowledge transfer and um, that's completely being missed. And then the clean water and sanitation again show low inclusion of the references from these countries, despite again the region's expertise in dealing with the water scarcity and the sanitation issues. So that's just one example um, of how the data can can tell that that story as well. So, do you know I, I do believe that um, the culture and uh, research integrity is it's an inclusive metric that can be used throughout, and there is an intersection with the sustainable development goals. Um, I believe as well that the a detailed author contribution and funder information would show the global research landscape. It can be done better. The data is there to do this, and that collaborations and interdependencies between the global north and the south can be, you know, they can be really shined upon or if we use the data properly and use the proper data or the available data that's there so that we can identify the areas where funded um, SDG research is thriving and, and also where more support and resources are needed because there's you can see a lot of citation from particular areas but maybe not so much research themselves but that would indicate that they're ready to do the research they just need that support. Um, so again it's a uh, it's God, this hasn't copied over, sorry. Um, it's uh, They're excelling in these good practices and it just underscores the significant potential just for institutions to play that leading role in creating the more equitable um, ecosystem. So um, um, just always, uh, anybody that knows me would listen to the <laughs> nauseam of me saying how I believe these good practices should be recognised and rewarded. And I mean, there's a... Uh, there's, I would recommend you to start looking at maybe TCC and um, their website. They have some blogs. I can certainly share the, the links with you, Nick, after. But there's a webinar there and Dr. Evelyn Gatou from APHRC is on it. And she came up with some really hard hidden statistics. I'm always about numbers. Um, so like 15 percent of the world's population is in African regions. That's obviously rising. Um, but 25 percent of the global burden of disease is there in those regions as well, but those regions only cover 2% of the world's research output. And she also has some um, facts that I, I really could not believe is that when you look at major funders, even Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and that, they, they assign research funding to issues for around the African regions, 
but only 10% of that funding goes directly to the regions themselves. So when you hear those kind of numbers, something's obviously wrong, something needs to change, but I believe that the, the data is there to tell these stories and to, to make it better. So I believe in measuring it over time and seeing how we can improve it. Um, that's really my, that's all I have to, to say on the, no, on the issue. That's great, Anne. Thanks very much. And uh, sorry for the few issues with the slides, but I think we saw most of them, so that's fine. Uh, I will okay. hand over to Sarah. There was just one question that I'll put to you very quickly now, just a, a, a question from Kirsty about, because uh, you mentioned some additional organisations, and she was just wondering if you'll be adding those to RAW, to the Research Organisation Registry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, That that's the project that um, Joy is working on and Dexon. Um, those organisations getting them great ideas and adding them to Roar as well, so they're identifiable and we can report on them. Okay, I just wanted to pick that one up before we hand over to Saab because uh, it was just a, a quick question. So I'll hand over to you, Saab, and uh, again, just to encourage colleagues, we've had a few questions, but do please post any questions as we go and uh, over to you, Saab. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, this is uh, I want uh, I want to thank Nick and Tom and the Knowledge Equity Network for this opportunity to speak about this work because I uh, personally feel it's super important to raise these issues as regularly and as vocally as possible and uh, also that this work uh, is not just my work it's been in collaboration with many many people at uh, the Public Knowledge Project and. Also, it's not mentioned here, but this was started off during my time at the University of Oxford. So many collaborators there had invaluable feedback that goes into this work. So I would like to acknowledge that. Um, but um, getting started on this topic about recalibrating the scope of scholarly publishing, this is also the name of our paper that came out a couple of years ago. Um, we started off in a landscape where the current narrative around academic publishing was that sometimes people just say that too much academic research is being published. This was in a 2018 article, uh, which got a lot of citations from Altback and DeWitt. Um, there were estimates suggesting around 30,000 scientific journals. Um, there was talk of overpublication, um, which leads to pressure on top journals, a rise of low quality publishers as per the claims, and also reduction in a way uh, in research publication might be needed to handle these challenges. Um, the current narrative at that time also mentioned the post-colonial struggle in publishing, so I need to mention that. It was, um, um, the, there is mention of peripheral universities, and they are considered to be dependent on central institutions for direction. And a lot of the times the peripheral institutions are in the global south and they face a lot of challenges in terms of the resources they have, uh, the visibility that they have um, in developing or uh, improving upon their research capabilities. And there's always this academic dependency uh, that uh, if you're a researcher, say, publishing in Indonesia, um, you would would you be publishing in a journal which is, say, open access and hosted on a quality server in your own country versus maybe going for one of those so-called mainstream publishing platforms where your work gets more cited? Uh, so that's that's the kind of challenge that an individual level, at, at an individual level, an academic has to deal with. Uh, um, but given this background, the thing that we wanted to focus on was that there is certainly a big need to decentralize academia from its Western focus. Uh, despite the challenges that I just mentioned, there are many, many people in the Global South who are leveraging open source publishing platforms very effectively. And it's uh, almost a responsibility and duty uh, to recognize and realize the full potential of this research, which then can shift and enrich academic discourse um, and this this very narrative of underrepresented researchers is what we try to highlight in our study. Uh, we speak about a diversity from different angles, and I'll show some numbers very quickly. Um, diversity in terms of geography, in terms of language, in terms of the disciplines that these research articles cover, 
And also, I'll finally talk about the visibility that this research gets, given the diversity that we see here. Um, and before I get uh, going into the numbers, um, the data that we use for this is coming from uh, journals using OJS. Uh, so OJS is the Open Journal System software developed by the Public Knowledge Project. Uh, and so we the the data is coming here when uh, the journal installations request security updates uh, through our software called the Beacon. Uh, this gives us an estimate of how many journals are actively using these security updates and how many articles have they published in a given year. So that's that's the data source. And in 2020, we saw that around 25,671 journals were meeting this active standard of publishing at least five articles every year. Uh, and uh, the number more recently is much higher now. It's close to around 34,000. Um, um, and it's it's growing uh, at uh, a good pace. Um, in terms of articles as well, like in 2020, which was when we analyzed the data for our paper, uh, these journals published are almost a million articles. And... Uh, a total of more than 5 million articles since the inception of these 25,000 journals. And that all the data for this uh, analysis is public with our paper and can be found on the Harvard Dataverse. Um, I'll quickly jump in and talk about the three dimensions of diversity. So the first one was geographic diversity. Um, the way we identified geography of a journal is through a three-step process. First is you use the journal ISSN and use the lock ISSN API to map the ISSN to a mark code. And the mark code is then mapped to a location, which is most often a country. Uh, if that doesn't help us, because there, there might be some missingness or invalid ISSNs in the data. If that's the case, then we look at the top level domains from the URLs that the journals have. And then we map these top level domains to their ISO 3166 alpha codes. Uh, and finally, if even that is not possible, then we try to geolocate the IP address uh, for the journal host using um, the GeoLite2 free geolocation data. So uh, this three step process is trying to minimize the amount of missingness we get in location for these journals and try to identify where this research is coming from. Uh, and this is the global distribution that we end up finding. Uh, and you can see that there's a considerable research being published in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, uh, in India as well. Uh, you see centers around Turkey, Spain, uh, uh, and of course you see the United States as well, uh, which is expected. Uh, but if you look at a ranking of these nations, you see that Indonesia is, is one of the biggest uh, in the open journal software's data set, followed by Brazil, the United States, Spain, India, and so on. And the success of Indonesia as, as a, an open access story is, is not something that's just in our data set. It has been acknowledged. Uh, this was a study, I think, that came out in uh, Nature a couple of years ago, where Indonesia is leading the world in, in open access publishing charts, followed by Colombia. Uh, so this is this is not a surprising find in terms of Indonesia at all. And if you look at the regional distribution, uh, you see that a lot of of the the Western Europe and uh, the the uh, the North American uh, region is just at number three here, whereas most of the journals are coming from Asia Pacific, followed by Latin America. And if you look at the geopolitical distribution in terms of income groups, you see that 81% uh, of journals are coming from Global South nations, which would be uh, upper middle, lower middle, and low income nations. And only around 19% come from uh, high income nations. So a lot, a lot of representation from uh, countries which are traditionally underrepresented in mainstream indexes. Um, let me talk about the second aspect now. Uh, the second aspect talks about linguistic diversity. So we tried to use Google's compact language detector on the 100 most recent published articles to identify the language of a journal. 
Um, and uh, I, I won't go into the detail, but I can answer these questions around these methods if needed when we go into the qu questioning phase. Uh, but we found using our method that there was research published in 60 languages at the very least in these journals. And there is still 50% of these journals publish articles in English, but this is still much better than, for instance, comparing to Scopus, which has publications in 40 languages, uh, and around 93% of them are in English. So the, the English proportion is much more even in the data that we have. Um, and this is the this is like the the ranking table again for language uh, and you can see english is around 50% followed by indonesian uh, then spanish and portuguese and then several other languages another interesting thing was this multilingualism that we saw in the journals so almost half the journals are publishing in more than one language which was very interesting uh, and uh, only 45% have like a single language um, and you can see like these different combinations of languages that we see in the data. So for instance, the second column in this, uh, in this chart is a combination of English and Indonesian. The fourth column is English with any other language. The fifth is English with Spanish and so on. So there's a fair bit of multilingualism. Um, and this certainly challenges our assumption of having English as the universal language of science and recognizing efforts uh, that 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 this is causing some detrimental effects on knowledge production. This recognition is very important. Um, I'll jump to disciplinary diversity now. So we d identified disciplines or fields uh, for these research articles using the ANZSRC classifications. Uh, and we saw that a majority of these journals were focusing on the social sciences, followed closely by STEM and lastly by humanities. Uh, and this is the breakdown by like a more granular uh, disciplinary level. And you can see medicine comes out on top, often as expected in many indices, followed by uh, general social science studies and then engineering and then commerce and education and so on. Uh, the fact that we have such a big STEM presence in these journals as well uh, is essentially like uh, a call for having a globally distributed basis for STEM research, which has an even more like skewed situation where research is mostly cited from the global north in STEM. So, so that was another important finding here. Um, now, lastly, I will talk about uh, the visibility of this research. Uh, given these diversity aspects around geography, language, disciplines, is this research even visible in different uh, indexes that researchers use to write papers, for instance? Um, the motivation for this, again, was uh, the case of Latindex, for instance, which has now around 24,000 journals, but only 0.5% of it was uh, covered by the Web of Science, which led to the establishment of LAT index. We try to cover uh, the visibility of journals using OJS with all mainstream indexes, including Web of Science, Scopus, EBSCO, Dimensions, Google Scholar, OpenAlex, and so on, as well as you can see uh, like predatory lists uh, to see like how much overlap we have there as well. And the mapping was done based on ISSNs, followed by URLs, followed by the domains. And this is what we find in terms of the visibility. And uh, I would like you to focus on the last column, the OJS percent in this table, which tells you how many of these OJS journals are indexed in each of these research indices. So Web of Science has only 1.2% of these journals. EBSCO has three, uh, Scopus has four. Uh, uh, some of the more recent ones uh, with dimensions, now we have a much higher overlap uh, more recently. I think it's crossed 70%. Uh, we have high overlap with Google Scholar and Open Linux as well because uh, the ingestion mechanisms and the way they get papers is much uh, different from what we have in Web of Science or Scopus. Uh, and it's it's strange and like a prob like likely problematic that like um, our common assumption that Web of Science, Scopus, and EBSCO 
constitute the scientific literature when 95% of them almost uh, uh, do not include research or research that's being published in the OJS journals, say, coming from the Global South. And uh, we also are now looking at some uh, initial citation analysis and trying to see like who cites these journals as well, apart from just the normal visibility. Uh, and the, the, the crux here is we are finding that English articles find citations outside OJS as well, whereas non-English articles are finding citations within the OJS world. And this is a pathway for future research. And lastly, before I go to the reflections, I want to mention that we found very little overlap with the predatory lists. Uh, only one person with Beale's 2017 list and uh, similarly with Cabell's list, which uh, calls for a new approach to address this problem. And the, that the fact that open access publishing should not be conflated with predatory publishing. And it's, uh, it's uh, dismissing this global research as predatory is uh, unscientific and that that uh, supports our call for recalibrating scholarly communication at a large scale. Um, and that's my second reflection. The first one was that the numbers are certainly significantly understated. Going back to the 30,000 mentioned in the beginning, uh, there is significant bibliodiversity in terms of geography, language, discipline, as we saw in the numbers that I showed you. And our, our work is just a first modest step in trying to rescale scholarly communication. And there are many more unanswered questions that need to be answered. But lastly, I would want to say that a, a global, diverse, and inclusively world of scholarly communication, it's not just possible, it's already underway. And it's, it's up to us to give it more recognition and give it more visibility in research. And you can read more about uh, uh, these findings in our paper. Uh, you can find it at this QR code as well. And I'll hand it back to Nick for discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. But yeah, it's such important work. And I'm just, Ross Mounts has just commented there, just really sort of acknowledging the fact that how, you know, Web of Science scopes and EBSCO acting as horse blinkers and wondering how many researchers, for example, in the UK actually realise this and that we really need to do more to raise awareness, which of course you're doing. And I'm, I suppose, even from my own point of view, you know, and I've been working in this area for a long time and I kind of understood this stuff implicitly, but to see you put it out there in real hard numbers is quite um, striking, I think, in terms of just how big the, the, the issue, the problem is. Somebody else did comment. I think it's gone actually, but I just wanted to um, address sort of the elephant in the room in terms of the cost of publishing. Though, so one, as I say, I think it's gone. But somebody suggested, which, as I say, is a is a truism really. The costs of publishing actually preclude publishing in major Western journals for a lot of colleagues in the global south. So while the, you know this is great, but it's it's symptomatic of a more systemic problem in terms of the very cost of publishing. I mean, I don't know if you've got any immediate thoughts on that or the, you know, the the tension there with that real fundamental issue in terms of the cost of now, how much it costs to publish open access, for example. Yeah, I think, yeah, you've he I've heard a lot of comments just from different events I've been at. Um, some would say the cost to publish in a, in a journal could be a year's, salary for a PhD student or you know a year's salary for a researcher it's they are quite expensive but um yeah I think that that's why we have to um really just open up the field to where the research can be captured from and, and what we're actually measuring I don't think any researcher wakes up in the morning and said, right, my aim with my research is to publish in a specific journal and to have a H index of this number. You know, the research is a vocation and they want to get their research visible and seen. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Were you any observations on that point, Saurabh? Does that sheer uh, cost of publishing and, and how it's actually necessary to publish, you know, using OJS, which is good, but it's symptomatic of the, the high costs of publishing? through the Western Journal. I think, yeah, it, it's part of, it's part of uh, 
kind of a vicious circle in a way where you you have these high publication fees, which is uh, highly correlated with people who are able to pay, pay those fees are the people who have access to a lot of resources. They have much less language barriers. They have much higher institutional support, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and during my time as a PhD student at Stanford, I was realizing that these like publishing in uh, nature or science or uh, like you have pay like thousands of dollars and people don't fret about it that much there whereas uh, like if i were doing that during my undergrad university back in india it would be a major issue mm -hmm. it's uh it's um uh, i think they, it's certainly a, a systemic issue and tied tied into all these correlates with language institutional support mm -hmm. and uh limited even opportunities for for uh, like researchers in the global south to say apply for grants that can cover these expenses uh, maybe some of these solutions some solutions could be to have uh, waivers or discounts on publication fees based on how uh, how resource uh, constrained you are mm -hmm. uh, maybe open access initiatives could be a part of that maybe there is some kind of capacity building that could be done around that. Uh, uh, but it's part of a bigger problem and I agree mm. totally with uh, the and the comment Anne made as well. Yeah, no, it was, thanks Ken Feinstein. So um, it was, uh, you've reposted the question. I don't know if I, I just lost it briefly, but that was your question around the cost of publishing. And you've just noted that uh, you were at a university where they wouldn't pay for EBSCO and expected scholars to find their own methods. Uh, and the library has suggested asking friends from the West for access. So you know, that just shows how um, systemic the the issue is. One other thing that just occurred to me as you were speaking as well, and I suppose that relates to some of these questions, is whether or not, or to what extent, there are cultural differences in the incentives to publish. Because that's a sort of another systemic issue that's been talked about a lot in the global north, you know, publish or perish and uh, the incentive to publishing these high impact journals as we're trying to address through door etc are there similar incentives or different incentives in the global south i wonder to publish research i mean Anne's already talked a little bit about the zero hunger and you know obviously i mean that's their real world problems that mm -hmm. we can't relate to in the same way so i just wondered if there are actually different incentives at play in terms of to, for research, for publishing, actually undertake and publish research. Um, there probably are. I wouldn't. I, yeah, no enough. No, no it was just a, a thought. Uh, but um, yeah, I would imagine because they're real issues, you know, that need addressed immediately. Um, because they're at the brunt of a lot of the issues with climate change, zero hunger. So yeah, I think the research has <laughs> it's crucial to address the problem there and then. So I would imagine. Um, so, but in terms of incentive in the Global North, you know, after working in an EDI unit and also trying to address some challenges with um, academic promotion and the, the metrics that were used for that, you know, thankfully we're seeing some change now because, you know, there's again, a lot of things perhaps in teaching would have been excluded from that. But I think um, universities in the UK and Ireland are certainly starting to incorporate a wider um, picture of a of a researcher or you know when they're looking at academic promotion now. but ken's commented there the same if not more and the desire for global ranks has pushed this very much so actually they're trying to catch up with the the, the ranking situation that we've promulgated in the north i suppose any any thoughts from you sir on incentives so i think uh certainly there's like some differences are in terms of the what counts towards your, say, promotion as a researcher or an academic or a faculty member. Um, they, uh, many times in, like, I know in some Indian institutions which I work with, the, the number of publications or the, the quality of publications is not one of the primary factors. Like, so the, the way uh, hiring uh, protocols are different could drive this. So like you you have to be in a publisher parish culture, say in the United States or maybe in Western Europe. But uh, in some universities, you just might be valued more based on the years of experience you have as an academic and publications are maybe a secondary factor. And that it like automatically pushes you 
to be like less uh, focused on publications as you would do in maybe in some countries in the global north. So, mm -hmm. so there are certainly, I think, differences that might arise out of the policies that institutions implement for mm -hmm. uh, people to succeed in those settings. And uh, I can specifically sp speak of academic settings in this case. Yeah. I'm conscious of time. I mean, I don't have to rush off, but uh, I, I don't know if so, but Han, you need to, because we could take a couple more questions after the hour, if that's okay with you. But obviously, I understand people might need to, to rush off. Is that okay? Because um, there's lots of questions that I would like to ask. But uh, I mean, one for you, Han, maybe that might be slightly um, controversial. I don't want to put you on the spot, but from my colleague, Leanne. So she's just, uh, I think you know Leanne. Um, she's just yeah. asking whether any updates on whether dimensions, for example, might one day replace Scopus and Sci-Val as a data source for the THE and uh, QS World University rankings. I think um, I'm actually at a THE event now, I have to confess, I'm at the Global Sustainable Development Congress. But I'm here to, again, champion the whole idea of using a diverse data set. And I um, don't think they'd ever replace you know, love you know I just love for a more open data set to be used um I I think sometimes um people run away from me when I start talking about this issue especially when it's um related to sustainable development goals so I would always advocate for a more diverse data set to be used it doesn't have to replace one or the other um I think um if you do use a multitude of data sets then you, you do cover everything um and, and just remove that bias from using one data source. Um, because, you know, obviously, again, it's a global issue and we've just kind of shown here that, that there is research being overlooked and there's research that's not visible that really impacts these, like, you know, nations on global issues, climate change, zero hunger. So I would love for ranking organizations to consider just spreading the wings and, and using multiple data sets, not just not just one. That's my diplomatic answer on okay, that one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is just a question pops up that people are talking about open Alex, but to what extent was that used in your um, yeah. analysis? And uh, Ross has also pointed out that Leiden actually uses open Alex now. So that's a another yeah. open data source, isn't it, for diverse? Yeah, and Terence Heyer did use that for the recent interdisciplinary um, science rankings. I think they might be moving back to, to Elsevier again, but yeah, I, I think it doesn't have to be one or the other, but I do believe it should be um, a multitude, you know, just to cover all bases. Yeah. Was this, I'm just reading a comment from Jonathan Smith there, talking about um, his data on environmental social movements in Indonesia using existing data. We found a wealth of other studies across Indonesian open access journals using Google Scholar, in contrast to the limited data available using publications on WAS or Scopus. Okay, so we cite in your research. Um, so yeah, I'm conscious of the time. I mean, though, I'm just trying to think of if there's one good question we can finish with. Um, there's one from Antonio. So Antonio, uh, if you're still there, Antonio, I know you had other things going on this morning, but he's just asking um, if to what extent we might promote alternatives to things like the Research Excellence Framework. Um, so through Ken, so Antonio is another colleague from the Knowledge Action Network. Um, he suggested that African countries should develop a research Ubuntu framework, which is, I know, from the, uh, the, the I'm not even sure what language, but African language. Um, so, you know, is there collaborative, I suppose, what can we do as a, as a collaboration, as a community of, uh, of people that are interested in these issues? You know, how can we promote, how can we move forward, I suppose, other than keep raising awareness? I think it's to keep building the networks. I mean, even over the past couple of months, um, between yourself, Nick, and me, and, and meeting with Sara as well, and we've already got people in common that we work with and I think it's it's just building that network as well and collaborating with each other getting the data out there and, and evidence in it because a lot of this is known anecdotally but yeah. when you see those facts and figures um it does help push that case yeah and that's, that's what I said at the beginning so uh, I don't know if you've any final thoughts so but really seeing the data from you you know that really brings it home just what a massive issue this is 
Absolutely. And I think, uh, the, as Anne hinted, uh, the fact that we are speaking here uh, from different backgrounds and perspectives is probably one of the things that we need to do more often. Um, it's uh, the fact that these new uh, corpora are much more extensive, like Dimensions or Open Alex have much more exhaustive coverage of, of the world. And uh, one of the things that we have been trying to do is that we are trying to share the ISSNs and identifiers of journals uh, that we find in the Global South, and we see they are actively publishing articles, and we share these these ISSNs and DOIs with Google Scholar, for instance. So that's something we did with Google Scholar, and uh, they were trying to see like what are the reasons for their exclusion, like why 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 are they not there? So in a way, improving their own. Uh, infrastructure uh, to look at features that might just be discriminating against journals just because they are in a different part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that in itself leads to improvement of, say, dimensions or open Alex or whether any kind of framework that's that's making this research visible and it lends more visibility to this research. So mm -hmm. that's another thing where we are trying to work in a collaborative way with different platforms that make this research visible. Yeah, and uh, I mean, one of the other things that we touched on earlier when we were talking before was potential community action on preservation of intellectual outputs. I mean, that's a massive issue in the global north, let alone the global south. So you mentioned all these instances of open journal systems that you ping with this beacon and you know they're live, et cetera, but there are many of those won't have DOIs and they won't have any form of pres formal preservation, all that kind of stuff. So there's perhaps a role for the global yeah. community there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, add them to Wikidata, yeah. Let's add them to Wikidata, okay. Good. Yeah, um, that, I'll pick that up with you, Kirsty, another time, because I'm, uh, as you may be aware, I'm very interested in all things Wikimedia and uh, I'm still learning about Wikisite, but no, that's great, thanks very much. So thanks, Sorab and Anne. That was really um, interesting and uh, informative with uh, illustrated by the number of colleagues that have stuck with us, I think, on a Monday morning. We've still got a fair few there. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, do please get in touch with uh, any of us. And certainly, you know, as I say, if we can collaborate through the, the various networks we're all part of. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you all. So um, with that, I shall draw the event to a close and uh, everybody have a good day or a good evening in your case, Anne, and uh, see if you can affect change over there in uh, at your conference. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Okay, bye. Thank you.